Welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch with me, Zinati Kuma, and joining me to take your stock related questions tonight are Tamsang Neta from Shiloh Capital and Grant Nader from Benguela Global Fund Managers. Be sure to send your questions via email to stockwatch at bdtv.co.za via SMS to 41392 or on X using the hashtag Stockwatch. Thank you so much for your time, gents. There's so much company news. So I. I won't waste your time and talk about what is happening in the markets right now. But a, a hot topic today, I don't know if this is one that you've been looking at, capital and regional. Um, yeah, they had a cautionary announcement out today saying that they've gotten an offer from Vugile and um, that the majority shareholder growth point uh, has gotten an expression of interest from another REIT, New River. So assuming that... Uh, there's going to be um, a takeover war for capital and regional. Um, I want to start off with you, Grant. Is there something that you are looking at and how exciting is this? <laughs> so, unfortunately, um, we don't hold capital and regional, but we do hold Vukile. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. I mean, I haven't had a chance to go through the deal uh, in detail yet. I do like some of the capital portfolio. I like the sort of the positioning of some of it. Uh, and so it could be interesting. And obviously these kind of things are always about price. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, we're still, we're still working through the numbers. So I, I can't really comment on yeah. whether I think it's a great deal or a poor deal well, at this stage. I actually, I it's actually, an interesting little deal. I actually started with you because I know that you've spoken about Vukile before. I think you've made it a stock pick hmm. of yours. But just looking at, you know, the composition of Vugile's portfolio right now, do you think that the time is ripe uh, for them to be expanding, Grant? Mm, that's a, that is a good question. And, and also, I mean, is it a natural fit? You know, so mm. that's that's the question as well that yeah. we, we'd have to ask. And uh, I'm always wary of the thing with expanding. There's nothing wrong with expanding, but you, I, don't, I don't like, as a rule, these, these sort of big bang expansion moves. You know, mm. uh, you you get far more success historically if if management does it in bite sizes where it does it doesn't you know it's not a big win big or lose big scenario and they incrementally build on a business you know you don't you look at Woolies with David Jones um, you know all these big things that happen often they just put the company at unnecessary risk so mm. you know I I need to look through the numbers it could be a good deal but yeah. I'm just concerned about the scale of the deal ah uh, all right um yeah. Uh, Tell me quite a number of listed companies involved here. There's Vugile Capital and Regional and also Growth Point. And I mean, we have also seen very interesting share price movements there. Of course, I think as expected, Vugile is a little bit down. Capital and Regional uh, up about 20%. Growth Point, I think the last time I checked, was up about uh, more than 2%. Um, is there anything that you can make out of uh, what is happening here and maybe just how you would play this if you would be playing it? Um, I, again, I'm like Grant. Uh, one has <laughs> to spend a little time digging into the numbers, but I think the concept of uh, acquisition growth or growth by acquisition uh, seems to be something we we appreciate uh, at the JSC level at yeah. least. So I think there's something to be said about especially UK assets or so UK listed REITs. Um, a lot of money has been lost there, so I think it, it needs mm -hmm. some careful consideration. But I think if the assets are bought at the right price and they're managed well, I think then there is a good transaction to have. But typically, there's a lot of complexity in these type of trades or transactions. So uh, they'll have to dig into the numbers. I think uh, Vugile will, will do well if mm -hmm. they acquire a good asset like this, but at the right price. Ah, uh, all right. Mm -hmm. I hear you on that front. Uh, well, let's get into uh, questions from viewers. Uh, there's a comparison. And actually, I was even speaking to da David Shapiro uh, earlier on, and he pointed out that uh, Southern Sun uh, produces good results. Uh, yesterday, Tsoho Sun, the complete opposite direction, uh, Tsoho Sun Gaming. There's a question here. Uh, is this a case of bad management? I would uh, imagine that is towards uh, Tsoho Sun Gaming. Uh, one buys back 617 million shares and reduces debt. And the other bizarrely buys uh, City Lodge. Uh, 
with a, yeah, a pile of debt, average results, smells like Sasol. Uh, would you go as far as um, <laughs> comparing Sasol uh, to uh, Tsohosan in terms of how it's managed to grant? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think the questions, the questions are fair. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the results today, revenue up only a little bit. And when you look at all the, take out all the one-offs, you know, the earnings were down. So sort of mm -hmm. negative operating leverage there. Uh, they have been slow to recover from the COVID crisis. And some, clearly some hotel groups have done better than others at recovering. And, uh, you know, one that struggled was City Lodge. Uh, others that, uh, you know, some that have done well, like Sun International, mm. Sudden Sun looks like they're starting to recover quite nicely. So there's definitely different positioning and then there's different different management. And Soho has been a little bit disappointing. Uh, it hasn't really gone anywhere for a couple of years now. Yeah. Even with the post-COVID travel boom and all of that, they haven't managed to capture much of that recovery. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not excited uh, about it. I'd like to have seen them done more at this stage. Um, there are people spending, there are people traveling, mm. uh, but they don't seem to be capturing enough of that. It's quite interesting, Tommy, because there's been this narrative where people are trying to position themselves in terms of the growth prospects of the gaming industry. Um, why is that not filtering through to uh, Soho? Well, I think largely the gaming industry is growing online. So there's a lot of online growth uh, which they're competing with. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that 7 billion debt, uh, I think, is also something too to not uh, scoff at. It's a big number and they need to deal with it. Um, I think when you own real estate and people must come to you to gamble, you are in a difficult position in comparison to someone who has a phone and can sit at home and do the same thing. So I think the, the digital side is something they really need to focus on to grow. Uh, anytime a company slashes dividend, there will always be concerns about what's going mm -hmm. on with the business. But I think they need to start looking at addressing uh, the debt burden and also moving more digital and building out that digital side of their gambling business. Um, and I also think they've got some very sizable assets, Monte Casino, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, competitively, if you look at it competitively, it's a difficult place to draw people to travel to. It's within the urban area of Johannesburg. And really, at the end, what they offer is you're able to come and gamble. And in competition to other opportunities or other alternatives, which have travel, which are great resorts, are outside of the urban areas. Mm. So I think they have to really start looking at the digital side of gambling and how they're going to incorporate that as, as a line item. Well, I mean, just another concern that the viewer has is uh, Toho uh, piling on uh, City Lodge. A grant, do you think that maybe this uh, has been a mistake or maybe in their rationale it was a, a thing of diversifying for them? Uh, it may have been with an uh, idea of diversifying, but I don't think it's a good asset. I think it's a it's a tired old asset that's got very low brand value a attached to it. Um, and I think it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. Uh, I don't think the returns are particularly good. Mm. I watched that one closely for a couple of years post-COVID and yeah, there wasn't a lot of signs of of life. You know, it's on the sort of that, I think that pocket of the market is quite vulnerable to cost saving to to a slow mm. economy. You know, the Zoom yeah. meetings are, are much more cost effective. Yes, business travel has resumed, but only in certain pockets of the business community in certain, and in even with individuals, there are various LSMs that are traveling and spending freely and are comfortable, and there are yeah. others that are under a lot more pressure. And I think City Lodge is positioned in the wrong place for that. So, uh, and I think they're very vulnerable to the Airbnb competitive type of landscape as well, Booking.com, etc. So, yeah, um, I don't think it's a good. I wouldn't be buying that uh, asset. Yeah, you've been nodding not your head, mention, Tammy. <laughs> yeah, not to mention Southern Sun was part of was part of this whole whole group, yeah. and it was carved out and those hotels were removed and listed separately. Now you're going back into the hotel mm. setup, uh, trying to acquire okay. assets that are old and as as uh. revenue-wise and not as generative as the hotels you carved out. Yeah. So I think uh, that's part of the, the strategy that's uh, from an investor perspective yeah. is quite poor. Ah, uh, all right, all right. Well, thank you for those insights, Jens. Uh, there's a question here on uh, Investec. Um, it was quite 
weird to see the share price reaction to the earnings. Uh, Investec results seem solid, however, counter ends 4.5% down on the day, where expectations so much higher than the results delivered. Um, yeah, that's also one that's stumping me, Grant. And I, I would say the same. I, I think the results were in line. I thought it was a solid set of numbers. The UK Bank doing well, SA Wealth doing well. SA Bank was a little bit stagnant, stagnant, but credit loss ratio is in line. You know, I, th I thought it was solid. The ROE uh, being, you know, the ROE targets, they've been improving the ROE metric, which is key for a bank for the past number of years. They've really finally been paying attention and they're moving in the right direction with more to come. So they've revised their target upward over the next couple of years. You know, I can't see a lot to be unhappy about. Perhaps it just ran ahead of the number, you know. Mm. This is one of those situations where you can't look at the price movement of the stock to decide whether you want to own it or not. Look at the fundamentals, look at what the business is doing. And mm. I thought it was a good update. Or maybe look at the price movement and think that this is a good opportunity. Tammy, uh, what would be your take on that? Yeah, look, any business that can move operating profit up by 8% in pound terms uh, needs to be seen slightly differently from mm -hmm. the average the average business. I think Investec, unfortunately, is competing with uh, other banks within the sector which have much broader reach in the market. So they have targeted a very narrow section of the market domestically and internationally, which is the wealth and high net worth individuals or high income earners. And I think as long as as long as the view is going to be that they don't have that broad market base, even if they reach their numbers, the view will always be manage your risk because if the sensitivity is at that level, income might change um, in comparison to all the other banks. But I agree largely with Grant. Uh, they've done their job. Uh, they produced good numbers. They declared a great dividend. Uh, and any growth of 8% of in pound terms is, is quite significant. Um, the UK business is great, and maybe part of it is the expectation that the UK business will continue to well or should have done further than was expected. But the business is doing great. Um, they're, they're turning around uh, a big ship and uh, having, par having carved out some businesses like 91, I think they're operating really well. Uh, there's a question here on Core Pot Ash, uh, a counter that I don't think a lot of people look at. Um, shares are up 125% in the last week. Should I take some profit? Uh, and I even did see today it was up uh, more than 13%. Uh, the viewer then uh, goes on to say, in general, as a long-term investor, should one have a rule that you take profits if you get over 100% in such a short space of time? Uh, Tammy, do you look at Core Pot Ash at all? Well, uh, we don't. We don't look at it, but um, I think it's a key product. Um, they are an Australian company listed in Australia, South Africa, and the UK, so they have covered the face of all sort of resource-based uh, listed companies. Um, I think you've got to you've got to have a view on where the company is and the causes of 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 the share price going up. We we had a lot of that happening uh, over the course of of the last two years in other businesses in, in the resource sector. So you have, you have to have a view on that. Um, profit taking is largely uh, a result of in, and the individual's view on income and the future of the stock mm. and the future of what the business is doing. Uh, you could take profits now at 100% and the share grows to a much larger rate. Uh, we, we, we used to have this debate with Capitec when it was at 33, then at 77, then 100. Sure. And now <laughs> we are talking about it. <laughs> At a much larger rate, so you've got to, you've got to have a view that you stick to, and there's a reason why you invested in that exact counter. If it's if you're trading the the price, that's one thing, but if you're looking at the long-term value of what the asset can produce, that's another. So, in principle, you've got to make that decision upfront and then hold to your strategy. Mm, so you need to have conviction in what you want to achieve. Uh, grant uh, Co Pot Ash firstly, mm. and secondly. Uh, uh, taking profits, and do you think that maybe uh, taking profits, uh, maybe some profits, not all profits, is something that long-term investors overlook? Uh, I know. So <laughs> I don't know the company well. Potash mm -hmm. is an area where a lot of big miners are investing, um, Anglo's, Billiton, etc. So there's clearly a long-term structural demand story there. What I will say is if you look at your portfolio, I'm not sure how much of it is in this company, but the the weighting of this stock in your portfolio has just doubled overnight or over a week. 
So you need to look at your portfolio context and understand now that it's created a, a different weighting and, and say, uh, is it the right size in the portfolio? I definitely don't suggest cutting your winners. You generally want to run your winners if they're good fundamental long-term stories. If it's a pop because of some hype or some short squeeze, mm. get, get some profit, take it off the table, definitely. So I think you need to dig into the fundamentals. I can't offer a view on that. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking some profit, but don't take too much. Mm -hmm. If the story and the reason you owned it, which is there must be a good story behind it, I would think, is still intact. Just take a little bit so you're right-sizing it for your portfolio, mm. but try and hold on to your winners. Ah, all right. Um, well, talking about right-sizing, um, Marion Roberts, uh, there's a question here. Um, Tammy, uh, I know this is one that a lot of investors... Uh, shy away from now but um with the company now lena uh, what would your uh, view on it be um i think it's a view on the industry at large and their ability to execute on it uh my view is that it's a it's a solid company uh ever since they walked away from the bar or oh, they didn't uh, approve uh the 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 m a transaction that was proposed by the, their German counterparts, I mm -hmm. think, from that point on, it's been really hard going. Um, they've managed to come back. I think the plan to re-enter Australia could pay off reasonably well. Uh, they have started cutting back their losses. So I think uh, they, they, are, they are doing well to recover. I think it's always about future business. What are they going to do going forward? How are they going to make money? Uh, what what structure do they take to to their industry and their execution ability in that? Uh, my personal view is I think it's a stock to hold. I think they're going to have somewhat of a better future than they've had previously, um, and largely because of their execution ability, uh, nothing more. Mm -hmm. uh, the industry is very rough. Uh, construction in general is hard, but as they venture out into all other revenue lines as well, I think they have a good future. Uh, especially if they continue to expand to other mining areas mm. where they are pretty strong. So I think that's where the growth lies for them. So as a, as, as a stock, I think it's a, it's a good buy, but it's a buy and hold for some time. Yeah, and uh, really hinging on execution there. Uh, Grant, what would your uh, take be on Murray and Roberts as it is? Uh, no, it's it's one I would I wouldn't I would stay away from it purely because the execution has been so poor for so long. Uh, it's been years of poor execution. The the only I think their path to recovery is if the construction sector improves. There are signs of that if you look at Rabex results. If you look at um, uh, I think uh, I can't remember who it was the other day. Aframat. Yeah. There there are signs that perhaps the industry is turning. Government infrastructure spend is improving. And the actual construction industry broadly is picking up a bit more. But the track record is just not there for me. I would rather buy a, more, a, a player that's continuing to deliver. It's got a higher quality. And uh, yes, this one could triple if they get it right. But the risk reward just isn't there for me based on the track record. Hmm. Well, uh, a company that has uh, actually quite a good track record, uh, particularly recently with the strategic moves, is Alex Forbes. Uh, I think they released a trading update uh, a few days ago and it looked good. Um, your view on Alex Forbes, uh, Tammy? Yeah, they've been a slow-moving elephant for a long time, even since the private equity transaction, where they were delisted and relisted. I think they've got a large set of assets. Um, the Mercer buy into them. Uh, along with, uh, with uh, I guess we'd call it uh, Mr. Mutepe and his crowd buy into it, uh, has always sort of weighed it down. I think they've made some good acquisitions. The Outvest acquisition, I think, was a great acquisition for them. Uh, they're going to have to, over time, prove they can operate further than where they've been. Um, they've got sizable assets under administration, um, and they've got to get this the system and the business moving further uh, within the market, I think they've got a lot to prove, mm. uh, given how they've performed over over the last couple of years since coming back onto the JSC. Yeah, um, growth prospects um, on on your side uh, for Alex Forbes uh, Grant. Well, I have to agree with Tommy. I mean, this stock is still down around forty percent from where it was eight years ago. So it has been wow. the opposite of value creation. Um, but what I will say is. 
the last couple of years you've actually seen some meaningful movement in the business finally potentially positioning to tap into this they've got a really good franchise a really good brand a really large base with which to work but they've been very slow to move i think there's been a, a vacuum in the leadership perhaps uh, you're starting to see signs that they're a little more focused uh, about what they're doing so i think there's potential there uh, it's not clear yet if there's been enough delivery to say with dead certainty it's going to be a winner but I like what they're doing, uh, and and I think the strategic moves around umbrella funds or DFMs uh, and some of these other positions and insurance and the like uh, look like they make sense. So there's potential. Mm, all right. Let's go on to commodities. Glencore. I'm considering building up a position in Glencore. Could you please ask uh, your panel what their thoughts are on a Glencore and if it is a buy, uh, would now at current price range of 106, 110 be a good entry point. Tell me, Glencore? Yeah, we, we've, we've held it for a while. I think it's a good stock. Um, they are a global operator and they operate well. Um, unfortunately, if you're in commodities, there's a lot of the business that's outside of your control, especially the price. So you are a price taker, and no matter how efficient you are as an operator, you generally are going to be at the realms of a commodity exchange somewhere in the world. So I think uh, that's that's the weakness of, of a company like Linko. Uh, but when we look at their operational track record, the assets they own, how they acquire them, how they dispose assets, I think they're a great operator. And I think there's always going to be scope for them to grow more. Uh, just uh, be aware the, the downside of, of owning a commodity business mm. is that you're a price taker. Last thing about uh, that I heard about Glencore uh, was when there were reports out that management was discussing <laughs> um, going for Anglo-American. But anyway, yeah. that, that, that seemed to disappear. <laughs> uh, Grant, your take on uh, Glencore, would, you, would, would, would it be a buy? Would you be considering it a buy at this point? Yeah, and I think I'll just qualify, as Tommy said, if you decide you want exposure to commodities and you're appropriately happy with where you are in the cycle, Let's put that aside. As a company, I like Glinko, I like the diversification, I like the portfolio, and I like the trading arm or the marketing arm, which adds a bit of a buffer to earnings when there's volatility and when there's a down cycle. I think it's a good management. They um, they are shareholder focused. So I think they do all the right things. It's a good business. I think you can do a lot worse mm -hmm. than owning Glencore if you want to own a diversified. Yeah, all right. Well, gents, let's get to your stock picks for today. Tabby, what are you picking? Uh, my stock pick is Procter & Gamble. Uh, I think they've done well over the last year. Uh, they're also doing well in terms of their distribution, understanding their clients and their business. They're competing well against Unilever, uh, which is their sort of uh, peer group. And I think there's a significant amount of growth still left in them. Mm, all right. Uh, Grant, where are, your, where are you putting your money today? So I'm picking a stock I picked last year. We've, we've held it for, for quite some time. It's ASML. Uh, I think they still are very well positioned to capitalize on this long growth runway of of this AI rollout that's happening globally. This infrastructure rollout uh, is is got a long way to go, and it's a way to play no matter who wins because everybody who's going to be making these chips for somebody they need machinery, they need the equipment, and that's what ASML does. They provide the equipment that allows the TSMCs and the other chip makers to produce these Nvidia chips and AMD chips and anyone else who comes in at the cutting edge. And so I think they're very well positioned for this long-term strategically powerful growth uh, opportunity that's there. And they are fairly priced, they're not cheap, mm -hmm. but I think for the growth runway, they still present opportunity if you're willing to look over three to five years. Yeah, well, something that's not cheap as NVIDIA. But uh, thank you so much for your time <laughs> and for your insights today, gents. Uh, that's all for tonight's Stock Watch. Uh, thanks to our guest, Tamsang Laneta from Shiloh Capital and Grant Nader from Benguela Global Fund Managers. Up next, the close. Stay with us. <laughs>